Good evening and welcome to the Gospel of Truth. I'm Alan Jackson, bringing to you spiritual songs and hymns and the power of the spoken word of God. First of all, giving thanks to God Almighty for blessing me with this another outpouring of his tender love and mercy and that he's allowed me once again to be on this the time side of life and to have this another blessed privilege to come to you in his name by way of this television medium and to bring to you another message from his holy and divine word. And as I always do, I'd like to continue to express my appreciation and my gratitude to the production staff for their continued service to the Gospel Truth. The Gospel Truth does have a prayer list, and we do encourage you to write to us and to send to us the names of your friends, your relatives, and your loved ones. And we will add their names to the prayer list. I'll pray for them, encourage you to pray for them, and everyone in the viewing audience to pray for them as well. Or you can send those uh, names to the Gospel Truth at P.O. Box 3944, Berkeley, California, 94703. Or you can call the prayer line at 510-848-8843. And there you can leave the names of your friends, your relatives, and your loved ones. We will add their names to the prayer list, and I'll pray for them, encourage you to pray for them, and everyone in the viewing audience to pray for them as well. And so this evening, I certainly want to welcome you to the February 2023 Gospel Truth Tribute to Black American History. I will begin with a crash course on the Black Women's Club movement. Hi, I'm Clint Smith, and this is Crash Course Black American History. Today, we'll be talking about the Black Women's Club movement. Women have always been central to the creation of social movements and have been able to find a unique voice for themselves in spaces that did not always want to acknowledge their power. Black women were present in so many important moments in American history. As speakers and orators in the antebellum period, spies and soldiers in the Civil War, and as anti-lynching crusaders. The Black Women's Club movement isn't always talked about in a lot of our public discourse, but I think it's time we give these women their due. Let's start the show. Plessy v. Ferguson ushered in the Jim Crow era, and many states took advantage of the Supreme Court's decision that made separate but equal the law of the land. This is important to note because a lot of times we think of Jim Crow as something that occurred in the 1950s and 1960s. But really, Jim Crow was thriving decades before that, and it dominated the South's social and political climate. And while Jim Crow perpetuated a lot of violence against black people in general, there was a specific sort of violence that it inflicted against black women. As a warning, this episode will contain mentions of physical and sexual assault. Because black people had largely been stripped of their civil rights and did not receive the sort of protection from the state that is typically afforded to citizens, they were subjected to lynchings and other types of mob violence. Black women specifically were constantly dehumanized, threatened with rape and other forms of abuse. American culture justified this violence against black women by portraying them as prostitutes, thieves, and just generally immoral people. So even though black women were regularly sexually assaulted, because society depicted them in a hypersexualized, immoral way, they were seen as having brought it upon themselves. But black women refused to stand for this. In an effort to protect their families and themselves, the Black Women's Club movement was started. It was a direct response to much of the violence and oppression that black women were being subjected to. Though it's worth noting that this movement was, in many ways, an extension of a longer history of black women's activism as orators, writers, abolitionists, and suffragists. The clubs were mainly grassroots organizations of middle-class black women who were one generation removed from slavery. They were well-educated and had their own careers and identities separate from their husbands, many of whom were lawyers, doctors, judges, journalists, and politicians. And many of these women decided not to marry at all, but to focus on their political work and careers. What made the work of these organizations different from some others that existed at the same time is that members of black women's clubs 
believed that advocating for black Americans was not just about obtaining civil and political rights for black men, but also winning those same rights for black women. One of the most important figures in the black women's club movement was Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin. Let's learn a little bit more about her in the Thought Bubble. Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin was born in the Beacon Hill neighborhood of Boston, Massachusetts in 1842. She started out in activism by recruiting black men to join the Union Army during the Civil War and served on the board of a number of charities. But by the 1890s, she turned her attention to advocating on behalf of black women specifically, and she would found the Women's Era Club in Boston, Massachusetts. It was a club primarily of black American women that had two goals, to offer opportunities for self-improvement and to speak out against the violence and oppression black Americans were experiencing. The club also published a newspaper called The Woman's Era. It was the first newspaper published by and for black women in the United States. Josephine's daughter, Florida Ruffin Ridley, was also involved in the operation. And together, they used this newspaper to help organize a conference that focused on issues affecting black women. It was called the First National Conference of Colored Women of America and took place in Boston in 1895. At the conference, black women were able to network, discuss, and organize among themselves in an effort to both build community and to find solutions to some of the most pressing concerns of the day. The conference even led to the founding of the National Federation of Afro-American Women. This was a coalition of 85 different organizations dedicated to promoting the rights of all black Americans by concentrating in the words of their constitution, quote, the dormant energies of the women of the Afro-American race into one broad band of sisterhood. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Josephine's work didn't end there. She was an advocate for women's suffrage, pushing the movement to fight for the rights of black women and not just white women. And she was one of many black women of the era doing this deeply important work. She was joined by women like Sojourner Truth, Angelina Well Grimke, and Gertrude Mossel. Josephine also helped found the Boston branch of the NAACP. While Josephine was chipping away at oppressive systems in Boston, another black women's club, the Colored Women's League, was founded in Washington, D.C. in 1892. Its founders included Mary Church Terrell, Anna Julia Cooper, and Mary Jane Patterson. It was a coalition of 113 local black women's organizations. In 1896, both the National Federation of Afro-American Women and the Colored Women's League merged to form the National Association of Colored Women. It was the largest federation of black women's clubs and served as a centralized force for many local and regional black women's organizations. Mary Church Terrell was the group's first president and their founding motto was, lifting as we climb. While they were committed to upward mobility and self-improvement among themselves, their ultimate purpose was to improve the lives of all black people. They were committed to intersectionality, even when we didn't have the word for it. Always examining issues in American society through the lens of both gender and race. Some of the National Association of Colored Women's most prominent members were the educator Fanny Coppin, the abolitionist Harriet Tubman, and journalist and anti-lynching advocate Ida B. Wells Barnett. In 1904, they changed the name to the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. And by 1916, they had a membership of almost 100,000 people, and there were over 300 newly registered clubs within the organization. As time went on, the organization expanded the scope of their work. During World War I, they raised over $5 million in war bonds. They provided social services for black Americans, including raising money for kindergartens, libraries, orphanages, and elder care. And they worked tirelessly to raise awareness about lynching and discrimination. But they made sure their work wasn't singularly focused on fighting social ills. So they also hosted events like concerts and literature groups, because they believed that those things are just as important to building community. However, when the Great Depression arrived in the 1930s, the self-help philosophies of black women's clubs became less popular. Black Americans started turning to organizations like the NAACP or the National Urban League, groups that more directly challenged racist systems and advocated for large-scale structural change. In 1935, Mary McLeod Bethune, an educator and activist, led a portion of the National Association of Colored Women's members 
who did not agree with the self-help philosophy of the group, to form the National Council of Negro Women, recognizing a need for women to still advocate for themselves and their specific challenges, Bethune's new group focused on using political activism to improve the state of Black Americans and their communities. They also took an interest in international affairs, later going on to support the founding of the United Nations. Bethune also used her position as a director of the Division of Negro Affairs for President Franklin D. Roosevelt, which, according to the Smithsonian, made her the first Black woman to head a federal agency, to talk to the press about the need for Black Americans to have federal jobs and other opportunities. In fact, she was one of the main creators of the Fair Employment Practices Committee, which banned discrimination in all federal agencies and all industries engaged in wartime work. Utilizing similar strategies as the National Federation of Afro-American Women that came before them, the National Council of Negro Women also created a newspaper. It was called the Afro-American Women's Journal. And later, it was named Women United in 1949. Over the next few decades, the Black Women's Club movement continued to decline in popularity, in part because changing gender norms pushed against previously popular ideas of modesty and respectability, and also because as more working-class Black women became involved in the fight for political rights, they brought a different and often more expansive approach to how this work should be done. Still, some of these organizations remain active today, like the National Association of Colored Women, now known as the National Association for Colored Women's Club Incorporated, and the National Council of Negro Women. They are both nonprofit organizations with the same goal, uniting Black women in pursuit of equality. It cannot be said enough. Black women have always been leaders at the forefront of American social movements. Our textbooks don't always include contributions that Black women have made to the fight for civil rights, but we should be absolutely clear that without their work, our country would not be where it is today. Black women's clubs were a central part of what allowed Black women to organize themselves and to come together as a community to make clear that in the fight for Black equality, Black women needed to be included. And in many ways, we continue to see the legacy of the women involved in these organizations today. If you look around at many of our contemporary civil rights efforts, many, if not most of them, are led by Black women. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Crash Course is made with the help of all these nice people, and our animation team is Thought Cafe. Crash Course is possible with the help of all the people who bought the 2021 Crash Course Learner Coin and by all our patrons on Patreon. Thank you to all our patrons and supporters for making Crash Course possible. I got my COVID-19 vaccination and here's why. This isn't about gimmicks or sentiment or what commercial I like. This is about facts. COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective. Millions of doses have already been given in the United States, and these vaccines have the most intensive safety monitoring in U.S. history. People from different races, ages, genders, and ethnicities participated in large clinical trials around the world to make sure this vaccine worked for all kinds of people. The amount of time and effort dedicated to developing these vaccines was huge. Scientists used existing research and technology so they could get the vaccines developed quickly and safely without skipping any steps. If you need any more information, use a reliable source like the CDC website to get the facts. You've been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. You have to carefully monitor your health for the rest of your life. And you have an increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease. Cut. Type 2, take 2. Action. You've been diagnosed with a new purpose, to fight for the amazing life you've made for yourself, to look that risk of heart disease square in the face and say, no, not me. You've been given a new opportunity to live. Get started at nodiabetesbyheart.org. And this is a crash course look at Shirley Chisholm. Hi, I'm Clint Smith, and this is Crash Course Black American History. Today, we're talking about the 1970s. And a lot of cool things happened in the 70s, like bell bottoms and tinted glasses and disco. But something really important happened in 1972. Now, I know what many of you are thinking. Well, of course, Clint. Stevie Wonder released his smash hit, Superstition. And while I agree, Stevie Wonder is the GOAT, there was another important piece of black history 
that also happened that year. In 1972, Shirley Chisholm became the first black woman to seek the presidential nomination from any major political party in the United States. Today, we'll learn about Shirley Chisholm's impact on society and how her historic campaign paved the way for so many black political leaders today. Let's start the show. In the 1970s, there were a number of movements happening in the United States. Movements centered on black, Latino, indigenous, women, and LGBTQ communities were all organizing in an effort to obtain and strive for equal rights. This is not to say that these movements were new necessarily, but that this time period saw a surge in their traction and their national prominence. And all of this was happening alongside the anti-Vietnam War movement and the sexual revolution. It was a time when public consciousness was shifting. Many of these movements changed the way that people viewed relationships between men and women and ideas about gender binaries. The movements also transformed youth culture and promoted a period of deep distrust in American authority and the older generation that perpetuated some of these institutional and traditional norms. Also during this time, there was an unfortunate shift in the economy. There was massive deindustrialization and inflation. Deindustrialization, which is a decline in manufacturing and thus a decline in economic activity, was happening in many cities in parts of the Rust Belt, a part of the United States that consists of many communities that relied on factory work and coal production for economic security. There were a lot of things happening and a lot of changes going on. All these dynamics, the social changes, the economic shifts, also changed who was becoming involved in politics. Taking the concerns of historically marginalized people seriously, or at least acknowledging that these issues even existed, started becoming increasingly important for candidates to have any sort of political traction. Even though Black Americans had long tried to get involved in the electoral process in whatever ways they could, this moment was different because they could finally get more directly involved than perhaps they had ever been. This era of politics immediately followed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which prohibited racial discrimination in voting. It essentially enfranchised Black Americans in the South by banning literacy tests and other practices that had previously kept them from voting. This allowed for Black Americans to have their voices heard in the ballot box, many for the first time. And honestly, when we think about when American democracy really began, many scholars argue that it's more accurate to say that it's beginning was 1965 and not 1776, because before that, a significant majority of adults didn't have the right to vote, one of the most foundational parts of any self-proclaimed democracy. And with Black people now able to vote, Black candidates became a more realistic possibility. And up steps the one and only Shirley Chisholm. Chisholm's candidacy and political practices were possible because of those political shifts. She proved that when you allow Black Americans to vote, electoral victories for Black candidates can happen. She represented Black people, but Black women specifically. And she made a specific distinction between the challenges that Black women face compared to that of Black men. She was also the child of immigrants, reminding us that Black Americans are not a monolith, but come from a diverse set of backgrounds and experiences. Let's learn a little bit more about Shirley's early life in the Thought Bubble. Shirley Chisholm was born Shirley Anita St. Hill in Brooklyn, New York in 1924. She was a Black American of West Indian descent. The oldest of four daughters, her parents were Charles St. Hill, a factory worker from Guyana, and Ruby Seal St. Hill, a seamstress from Barbados. Both of their political ideologies aligned with those of the leader Marcus Garvey, who preached fervently about Black self-determination. Shirley spent most of her childhood living with her maternal grandmother and actually received her early education in Barbados. She later said she'd learned to love her skin and her heritage from her grandmother, and that her Caribbean identity played a huge role in her social and political views. She returned to the United States in 1934 and credited her education in Barbados as the main reason she spoke and wrote so well. She graduated from Brooklyn's Girls High School in 1942 and from Brooklyn College in 1946 where she pushed for more classes on black history and also encouraged more women to get involved in student government. 
her political interests also grew while in college. A critical moment for the development of her political philosophy happened when she attended a speech by Stanley Steinga, a leader in the Brooklyn Democratic Party. He claimed that black people needed white people to get ahead. Shirley did not agree with this, and she aspired to do exactly the opposite, prove that black Americans were self-sufficient and that they could get ahead on their own. Thanks, Thought Bubble. With a renewed sense of direction, Shirley kept her education going. As she worked in different roles as an early childhood education teacher and administrator, she continued taking graduate school classes and received her master's in early childhood education from Columbia University Teachers College in 1951. In 1964, she ran to be state representative of her local community, the mostly poor black and Caribbean neighborhood of Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. She won by a landslide and became only the second African-American woman in the New York State Legislature. In 1968, she threw her hat in the ring for Congress. She ran against the veteran civil rights worker, James Farmer, who was more politically conservative than her. Farmer, instead of respecting her as a candidate, framed her as too bossy and too feminine to be a great leader. However, her support from local women in a district where women outnumbered male voters more than two to one ultimately brought her to victory. Despite her historic win, she did not have an easy time when she made it to Capitol Hill. She was quickly placed on the Committee on Agriculture, despite Brooklyn not really being known as a rural heartland. She was mostly okay with it, though, thanks to the committee's role with food programs and migrant labor. Chisholm also played a critical role in developing the Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, better known today as WIC. But then she learned she was going to be placed on the Rural Development and Forestry Subcommittee, and that was too much. She openly protested the assignment, and her persistence paid off. She was reassigned to the Veterans Affairs Committee, famously remarking that there are a lot more veterans in my district than there are trees. But Chisholm wasn't done yet. In January of 1972, she announced that she was running for the Democratic nomination for the presidency at Concord Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York. In her announcement, she stated, quote, I am not the candidate of black America, although I am black and proud. I am not the candidate of the women's movement of this country, although I am a woman and equally proud of that. I am the candidate of the people of America, and my presence before you symbolizes a new era in American political history. Chisholm had always said that her greatest opposition came from men, regardless of race. And unfortunately, this proved to be especially true during her candidacy. One of her opponents that stood out most was George Wallace, the former governor of Alabama, who had famously stated that there would be, quote, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. He is most well known for the state-sanctioned violence he directed toward black Americans during the civil rights movement. So think about it. You had the person who, for so long, had effectively been the face of segregation, and a person who was effectively the face of black women in politics, running in the same primary. In the end, though, neither Chisholm nor Wallace would become the Democratic nominee. Chisholm's campaign was underfinanced, and she didn't receive much support from the mostly male Congressional Black Caucus. But she did have some success. She entered 12 primaries and gained 152 of the delegates' votes, about 10% of the totals in those 12 primaries. She also made huge strides in coalition building between women of all races and other liberal groups. Even though she did not receive the nomination, her candidacy and politics reflected the desire for change coming from these times. She envisioned and shaped the narrative about creating a multicultural space for political engagement. But the animosity toward her candidacy also played a role in setting up the conservative backlash and the law and order politics that we talked about in our previous episode in the War on Drugs. In 1983, Chisholm retired from Congress and became a professor at Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. She remained there until 1987. She collaborated with 15 other black women in 1990 to establish the organization African American Women for Reproductive Freedom. She lived out her retirement in Florida until she passed away in 2005. Chisholm made a huge impact on American politics. Even though she did not win the Democratic primary for president, 
her tenacity informed much of what we understand about liberal politics today. She was also an expert coalition builder and knew how to rally people together under common goals. She inspired so many female politicians and highlighted the misogyny that was present even within the black community. She laid the groundwork for subsequent nationwide campaigns for African Americans like Jesse Jackson in 1984 and 1988 and Barack Obama in 2008. And in 2015, in a sort of full circle moment, President Barack Obama posthumously awarded Shirley Chisholm with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian award in the United States. If you want to learn more about Shirley Chisholm and the impact she had on American politics, check out her autobiography. The book documents her rise to the U.S. House of Representatives and also has a really great title. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Crash Course is made possible by all of our viewers and supporters. Thanks to all of our patrons who support the show on Patreon, and thank you to all of you who participated in the 2021 Crash Course Learner Coin campaign. Your contributions and support helps millions of learners. I'm 77 years young, still going strong. Diabetes is not gonna slow me down, thanks to my Dexcom G6. This little wearable sends my glucose numbers right to my phone or receiver. And the arrow tells me which way I'm heading and how fast. So it's easier for me to keep my glucose in range. And the more time I spend in range, the more I can do. And trust me, this girl ain't slowing down anytime soon. The Gospel Truth does have a prayer list, and we do encourage you to write to us and to send to us the names of your friends, your relatives, and your loved ones, and we will add their names to the prayer list. I'll pray for them, encourage you to pray for them, and everyone in the viewing audience to pray for them as well. Or you can send those uh, names to The Gospel Truth at P.O. Box 3944, Berkeley, California, 94703. Or you can call the prayer line at 510-848-8843. And there you can leave the names of your friends, your relatives, and your loved ones. We will add their names to the prayer list, and I'll pray for them, encourage you to pray for them, and everyone in the viewing audience to pray for them as well. Or if you have a Bible question that you'd like to have answered, you can raise that question and leave that on the information on our phone and... We will answer that for you on the air. And I'm Alan Jackson, and I'm inviting you to join us again next week, if it's God's will, when the gospel truth will once again come your way, bringing to you spiritual songs and hymns and the power of the spoken word of God. Until then, it is my prayer that God will continue to bless you and your family and to keep you all safe.